Hi everyone. In this video, we will be reviewing the current state of the Pandemic Response Treaty and amendments to the International Health Regulations 2005. In this video, the areas of discussion will include the following. 1. A brief history of the World Health Organization, known as the WHO, and the World Health Assembly, known as the WHA. 2. Sequence of events to the 1st of January 2024 surrounding the drafting and negotiation of the Pandemic Response Treaty, hereinafter referred to as the Pandemic Treaty, and proposed amendments to the International Health Regulations 2005, hereinafter referred to as the IHRs. 3. Review of the current draft of the Pandemic Treaty, issued on the 30th of October 2023. 4. Review of the current report of the Review Committee regarding proposed amendments to the International Health Regulations 2005, issued on the 6th of February 2023. 5. Next steps regarding the adoption of the Pandemic Treaty. 6. Next steps regarding the adoption of proposed amendments to the International Health Regulations. 7. Process of adoption of the Pandemic Treaty and proposed amendments to the International Health Regulations at both a WHO, WHA level and in an Irish context. And 8. Avenues to challenge the adoption of the Pandemic Treaty and proposed amendments to the International Health Regulations. So, before we get into the areas of discussion, I want to be sure that everybody understands that there are two separate but connected events happening at the same time. These are the negotiation and drafting of the Pandemic Treaty and the negotiation and drafting of amendments to the International Health Regulations. Both of these events are happening at the same time in the WHO, WHA, but they are being undertaken by separate groups. That said, these groups meet both separately and together to review progress being made by both groups. And it is intended that the pandemic treaty and proposed amendments to the international health regulations will be voted on at the next annual meeting of the WHA, which is due to be held in May 2024. So we're going to start with section one, which is a brief history of the World Health Organization and the World Health Assembly. The WHO is an agency of the United Nations responsible for international public health. The constitution of the WHO was signed by all 51 countries of the United Nations and by 10 other countries on the 22nd of July 1946, thus becoming the first specialised agency of the United Nations to which every member subscribed. The WHO constitution formally came into force on the 7th of April 1948, with its main objective being the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. The WHO relies on contributions from its members and from private donors for funding. Its total approved budget for 2020-2021 was over $7.2 billion. And amongst the largest contributors were Germany, which contributed over 12%, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who contributed over 11%, and the United States, who contributed over 7%. The World Health Assembly, the WHA, is the decision-making body of the WHO. It's attended by delegations from all WHO member states, of which there are currently 194, and focuses on a specific health agenda prepared by its executive board. The main functions of the WHA are to 1. Determine the policies of the WHO 2. Appoint the Director General 3. Supervise financial policies and for review and approve the proposed programme budget. The WHA generally meets each year in May in Geneva, Switzerland, with its executive board generally meeting at least twice a year. In addition to meeting annually in May each year, the WHA has also held two special sessions in its history, the second of which was held in November 2021, to consider whether the WHO should draft and negotiate an international treaty on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. When we get down to the sequence of events section of this video, we'll discuss this second meeting held in November 2021. Section 2. Sequence of events to the 1st of January 2024, surrounding the drafting and negotiation of the pandemic treaty and amendments proposed to the international health regulations. 
In this section, we're going to commence with May 2020. The 73rd annual meeting of the WHA was held in May 2020. The agenda for this meeting at item three was titled COVID-19 response and stated the following. Recalling the constitutional mandate of the WHO to act inter alia as the directing and coordinating authority on international health work and recognising the organisation's key leadership role within the broader United Nations response and the importance of strengthened multilateral cooperation in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic and its extensive negative impacts. Further recalling the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern on novel coronavirus on the 30th of January 2020 by the Director General and the temporary recommendations issued by the Director General under the International Health Regulations 2005 also recalling the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 74 to 70 2020 on global solidarity to fight the coronavirus disease, noting Resolution EB 146 on strengthening preparedness for health emergencies, implementation of International Health Regulations 2005, and reiterating the obligations of all state parties to fully implement and comply with the International Health Regulations 2005, noting also WHO's Strategic Preparedness and Response Plan and the United Nations Global Humanitarian Response Plan for COVID-19. So the document that you can see on the screen right now is the actual agenda item three that we've just been discussing, and this is further information included within it. One, calls for, in the spirit of unity and solidarity, the intensification of cooperation and collaboration at all levels, in order to contain and control the COVID-19 pandemic and mitigate its impacts. Two, acknowledges the key leadership role of the WHO and the fundamental role of the United Nations system in catalyzing and coordinating the comprehensive global response to COVID-19 pandemic and the central efforts of member states therein. Six, recognizes the role of extensive immunization against COVID-19 as a global public good for health in preventing, containing and stopping transmission in order to bring the pandemic to an end. So under this section seven, it sets out specifically what they are asking member states to do. Seven, calls on member states in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Number one, to put in place a whole of government and whole of society response, including through implementing a national cross-sectional COVID-19 action plan that outlines both immediate and long-term actions with a view to sustainably strengthening their health systems and social care and support systems and preparedness, surveillance and response capacities, as well as taking into account WHO guidance according to the national context, engaging with communities and collaborating with relevant stakeholders. I'm skipping on to section 14 there now. 14, to strengthen actions that involve women's participation in all stages of decision-making processes and maintain a gender perspective in the COVID-19 response and recovery. 15. To provide sustainable funding to the WHO to ensure that the organisation can respond fully to the public health needs in the global response to COVID-19, leaving no one behind. And calls on international organisations and stakeholders. 3. To address where relevant in coordination with member states, the prolification of disinformation and misinformation, particularly in the digital sphere. And request the Director General, one, to continue to work with the United Nations Secretary General and relevant multilateral organisations, including the signatory agencies of the Global Action Plan for Healthy Lives and Wellbeing for All, on a comprehensive and coordinated response across the United Nations system to support member states in their responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in full cooperation with governments as appropriate, demonstrating leadership on health in the United Nations system and to continue to act as the health cluster lead in the United Nations humanitarian response. And 10, to initiate at the earliest appropriate moment and in consultation with member states, a stepwise process of impartial, independent and comprehensive evaluation, including using existing mechanisms as appropriate to review experience gained and lessons learned from the WHO coordinated international health response to COVID-19, including one, the effectiveness of the mechanisms at the WHO's disposal, 
to the functioning of the international health regulations and the status of implementation of the relevant recommendations of the previous IHO review committee. Three, WHO's contribution to United Nations wide efforts. And four, the actions of the WHO and their timelines pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic and to make recommendations to improve capacity for global pandemic prevention, preparedness and response, including through strengthening as appropriate the WHO Health Emergencies Programme. One of the reasons this agenda item is so important is because not only is it discussing what they consider to be public health and public good, but you can also see that the WHO and the WHA are endeavouring to extend their remit into areas such as women's participation in all stages of decision-making processes. The reason that I'm pointing this out is you will see continuously throughout this video that the WHO is not just interested in what they say is public health. They are very much interested in extending their remit across as many areas as possible under the guise of public health. Next, we move to September 2020. In September 2020, the WHO set up the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response to provide an evidence-based path for the future, grounded in lessons of the present and the past, to ensure countries and global institutions, including specifically WHO, effectively address health threats. This panel met approximately every six weeks beginning on the 17th of September 2020. This panel published its findings in a report titled COVID-19, Make It the Last Pandemic in May 2021. Amongst several recommendations, the report recommended a need for stronger leadership and better coordination at national, regional and international level and called for a pandemic treaty alongside a more focused and independent WHO and a senior Global Health Threats Council. Next, we move to May 2021. You'll recall at the start of this video that we said that the WHA, the World Health Assembly, meet every May in Geneva, Switzerland. So in May 2021, we're talking about the 74th WHA meeting, which happened on the 31st of May 2021. During the 74th WHA meeting, the following was decided. 1. That a member state's working group on strengthening WHO preparedness and response to health emergencies would be established to consider the benefits of developing a WHO treaty on pandemic preparedness response and targeted amendments to the international health regulations and thereafter that the working group would draft two reports. The first report to be submitted to the WHA before the 29th of November 2021 on the assessment of the benefits of developing a WHO convention agreement or other international instrument on pandemic preparedness and response and the second to be submitted to the executive board before the 24th of January 2022 were proposed actions for the WHO secretariat, member states and non-state actors. And the second action item that was decided at the 74th WHA meeting was to request the Director General to convene a special session of the WHA in November 2021, solely to consider the benefits of developing a pandemic treaty with a view towards the establishment of an intergovernmental process to draft and negotiate such a treaty while taking into account the report of the working group. Now, you'll recall when we were discussing a brief history of the WHO and the WHA that I mentioned that the WHA meets annually, but they have also held two special sessions in their history, with a second session held in November 2021. So the second item that was decided at the 74th WHA, being the Director General to convene a special meeting of the WHA in November 2021. This is the special meeting that we were discussing in the introduction. Now we move to October, November 2021. The Member States Working Group on Strengthening WHO Preparedness and Response to Health Emergencies held four meetings during the period July 2021 to October 2021. On the 28th of October 2021, the Working Group issued its Zero Draft Report of Member States Working Group on Strengthening WHO Preparedness for and Response to Health Emergencies to the Special Session of the World Health Assembly to the Director-General with the draft report being issued on the 12th of November 2021. 
the Director General published the Working Group report in advance of the special session of the WHA scheduled to commence on the 29th of November 2021. The conclusions from the report recommended 1. The establishment of an intergovernmental negotiating body in charge of developing a WHO treaty on pandemic preparedness and response and 2. To further develop proposals to strengthen the international health regulations, including potential targeted amendments to the international health regulations. The document that you can see on the screen at the moment is an overview of the recommendations from the draft working group report that was delivered to the WHA special session in November 2021. So as you can see, there are three areas that were highlighted. So the first area was to look at the existing frameworks around the international health regulations and the recommendation in this regard was fully implementing and complying with the obligations under the international health regulations by both state parties and the secretary. The second area was amending or building on the existing frameworks around the international health regulations and the recommendation in this regard was adjusting or amending the international health regulations establishing a global system for surveillance based on full transparency by all parties, strengthening WHO financing for emergency preparedness and response, and strengthening the governance capacity of the WHO Executive Board for Health Emergencies. So those two areas deal with the existing framework around the international health regulations. Then, in addition to the international health regulations, they also wanted to look at a new WHO international agreement or instrument. And in this regard, the recommendation was the establishment of a pandemic framework convention under Article 19 of the WHO Constitution, with member states' commitment to and accountability for prioritising pandemic preparedness through national whole of government and whole of society strategies. Next, we move to November, December 2021. Between the 29th of November 2021 and the 1st of December 2021, the WHA met in a special session to discuss the Working Group report and proposals, noting that this was the second ever special session of its kind in the history of the WHA. On the 1st of December 2021, the WHA agreed to the following. 1. To establish an intergovernmental negotiating body to draft and negotiate a WHO treaty. 2. That the first meeting of the negotiating body will be held no later than the 1st of March 2022. 3. That a working draft will be presented at its second meeting to be held no later than the 1st of August 2022. And 4. That the negotiating body would submit its outcome for consideration by the 77th World Health Assembly meeting in May 2024, with a progress report being delivered to the 76th World Health Assembly meeting in May 2023. Also, on the 1st of December 2021, the European Commission published a recommendation for a Council decision, authorising the opening of negotiations on behalf of the EU for the conclusion of an international agreement on pandemic preparedness, as well as for negotiations of complementary amendments to the international health regulations, with this recommendation confirming that this decision clearly sets out the Union's support for the establishment of a WHO process for a new framework convention on pandemic preparedness and response. It also indicated that the Union must be allowed to participate in the negotiation process in view of the Union's possible accession to such a treaty. In addition, an important number of member states have also expressed their support to strengthen the international health regulations, including through implementation, compliance and potential targeted amendments without reopening the entire instrument for negotiations. On the 29th of November 2021, the Director General established a white paper on the potential establishment of a new committee called the Standing Committee on Pandemic and Emergency Preparedness and Response. Next, we move to January and February of 2022. On the 19th of January 2022, the Director General published the second report referred to as an interim report of the working group in advance of the 150th Executive Board meeting on the 24th of January 2022. The conclusions from the report confirmed that the working group will continue its discussions centred around 1. A new treaty on pandemic preparedness and response and 2. Strengthening the international health regulations with the report to be submitted to the 75th World Health Assembly meeting in May 2022. 
On the 20th of January 2022, the Director General of the WHO communicated to states parties that the text of a proposal for amendments to the international health regulations had been submitted by the USA. On the 24th of January 2022, a draft decision was proposed by some 14 countries and the European Union to ask 1. The working group to include, as part of its ongoing work, dedicated time to allow for discussions on strengthening the international health regulations and 2. To urge member states to take all measures to consider potential amendments to the international health regulations. This decision was confirmed and passed on the 26th of January 2022. On the 28th of January 2022, a draft decision was proposed by some 11 countries to establish a Standing Committee on Health Emergency, Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness and Response until the closure of the Health Assembly in May 2025. On the 24th of February 2022, the first meeting of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, the INB, to draft and negotiate a WHO Convention Agreement or other international instrument on Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness and Response was held. You should note that much of the rest of this presentation will be focused on meetings and documents prepared by the INB. Next, we move to March, April 2022. On the 3rd of March 2022, the Council of the European Union published its decision authorising the opening of negotiations on behalf of the EU for the conclusion of an international agreement on pandemic preparedness, as well as for the negotiation of complementary amendments to the international health regulations. On the 12th of April 2022, the Director General of the WHO submitted the amendments to the international health regulations proposed by the USA to the World Health Assembly for its consideration. On the 25th of April 2022, the Director General of the WHO published a consolidated report of a number of agenda items for the 75th World Health Assembly meeting and under agenda item 16.2 stated strengthening WHO preparedness for and response to health emergencies. Noted that the decision of the Executive Board EB 153, which confirmed that the working group would include as part of its ongoing work, one, dedicated time to allow for discussions on strengthening the IHR and to urge member states to take all measures to consider potential amendments to the IHRs. Now we move to May 2022. On the 3rd of May 2022, the Working Group of the INB published its zero draft report, same being its second and final report to fulfil its mandate derived from Resolution WHA 747. The report requested that the 75th World Health Assembly consider the following draft decision. To adopt the zero draft report, including the onward process for IHR amendments outlined in paragraph 15 of the report, and to ask the Director General to report back to future WHA assemblies. On the 6th of May 2022, the European Council made a proposal for a Council decision on the position to be taken on behalf of the EU at the 75th World Health Assembly meeting as regards certain amendments to the international health regulations. It should, however, be noted that the EU has no voting rights at the WHA as it only has informal observer status. The 75th session of the World Health Assembly was held in May 2022. During this session, the majority of the amendments proposed by the WHA to the IHR failed. However, one significant amendment was agreed. This was to amend Article 59 of the International Health Regulations to shorten the time for future amendments to the IHR to enter into force from 24 to 12 months and to shorten the period for rejection or reservations to be submitted from 18 to 10 months, thereby allowing the international health regulations to be amended more rapidly in future. In addition to the amendments to Article 59 just discussed, the following was also agreed at the World Health Assembly meeting in May 2022. A. To continue the working group on strengthening WHO preparedness and response to health emergencies with a revised mandate, including as appropriate and if agreed within each region, the rotation of the Bureau and name the Working Group on Amendments to the International Health Regulations to work exclusively on consideration of proposed targeted amendments to the International Health Regulations for consideration by the 77th World Health Assembly in May 2024. B. To request the Director General to convene a review committee on the International Health Regulations as early as possible but no later than the 1st of October 2022. 
C to invite proposed amendments to be submitted by the 30th of October 2022, with all such proposed amendments being communicated by the Director General to all state parties without delay. And E to request the IHR Review Committee submit its report to the Director General no later than the 15th of January 2023, with the Director General communicating it without delay to the Working Group. Next, we move to September November 2022. In total, more than 300 individual amendments to the international health regulations were proposed by 16 state parties, some on behalf of groups of countries. The proposed amendments relate to 33 of the 66 articles contained in the international health regulations and to five of the nine annex. In addition, six new articles and two new annex were proposed. These proposals had to be submitted by the 30th of September 2022 noting that Ireland did not submit any proposed amendments. The review committee, which was set up to make technical recommendations to amendments to the international health regulations proposed by states parties, began its work on the 6th of October 2022. In accordance with decision WHA 759, the technical recommendations formulated by this review committee were to inform the work of the member states working group on amendments to the international health regulations. As per decision WHA 75-9, the working group was constituted as a continuation of the working group on strengthening WHO preparedness and response to health emergencies, with the revised name, the Working Group on Amendments to the International Health Regulations 2005, and a revised mandate to work exclusively on consideration of proposed targeted amendments to the IHRs for consideration by the 75th World Health Assembly meeting in May 2024. Next, we move to February 2023, noting that February 2023 was a particularly important month with respect to the draft Treaty on Pandemic Preparedness and Response and amendments to the International Health Regulations. On the 1st of February 2023, the zero draft of the Pandemic Treaty was issued for consideration by the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, the INB, at its fourth meeting to be held between the 27th of February and the 3rd of March 2023 in Geneva. And on the 6th of February 2023, the report of the Review Committee regarding amendments proposed to the International Health Regulations 2005 was also issued. Thereafter, between February 2023 and December 2023, meetings were held by both the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, the INB, to consider the draft pandemic treaty issued on the 1st of February 2023 and the Review Committee to consider the report on amendments to the IHRs issued on the 6th of February 2023. These meetings were held both separately and together. During these meetings, written proposals and submissions from member states and relevant stakeholders were discussed in both open plenary sessions, the records of which are publicly available, as well as in closed private sessions, the records of which are not available to the public. It's also important to note that a significant amount of coordination and collaboration happened and continues to take place between these two groups, the IMB and the Review Committee, with the following extract being taken from the report of the third meeting of the Working Group on Amendments to the IHRs, dated the 17th of May 2023. The co-chairs reported that the IMB and the Working Group bureaus held a meeting on the 23rd of March 2023 to continue to look at ways of collaboration and assistance in line with the mandates of the two processes. During this meeting, the bureaus discussed communication strategies to counter disinformation and misinformation on the working group and IMB processes and opportunities for communicating activities to coincide with the upcoming meetings. Over the course of several months beginning after February 2023, the INB considered and reviewed each article of the zero draft of the pandemic treaty, while the review committee considered proposed groupings of the proposed amendments to the international health regulations, as well as other issues such as future pandemic funding models. On the 19th of September 2023, following a meeting of the drafting group of the INB, an interim report of the meeting was published confirming that an updated text of the pandemic treaty will be published for consideration by the 16th of October 2023 and that this new text will be considered during the 7th meeting of the INB between the 6th to the 10th of November and the 4th to the 6th of December 2023 
with the 8th and the 9th meetings of the IMB to be held in a hybrid format from the 19th of February to the 1st of March and the 18th to the 29th of March 2024 respectively. On the 30th of October 2023, the updated text of the pandemic treaty was published. This 30th of October 2023 text is the current version still under consideration at the time of recording this video. While earlier on the 25th of October 2023, it was confirmed in the report of the fifth meeting of the Working Group on Amendments to the International Health Regulations that it appeared unlikely that the package of amendments would be ready by January 2024. In that regard, the Working Group agreed to continue its work between January and May 2024. The Director General will submit to the 77th World Health Assembly the package of amendments agreed to by the Working Group. So the next sections of this video will consider the current draft of the pandemic treaty, which was issued on the 30th of October 2023, and the report of the review committee regarding amendments to the International Health Regulations, which was issued on the 6th of February 2023. In this section three, we're going to carry out a review of the draft of the pandemic treaty issued on the 30th of October 2023. So the document that you can see on your screen is the 30th of October version. It's the version currently in circulation and currently under negotiation. So as we said earlier, this document is for review by the seventh meeting of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body. And you can see that it's down as provisional agenda item two. So the table of contents section states that chapter one is the introduction. Chapter two is the world together equitably and chapter three is institutional arrangements and final provisions. So the first section that we will look at is what's called the recital section. A recital is a statement of fact or reasons that explain why a law or a document or a contract exists. So within this draft of the pandemic treaty, there are 13 reasons set down in the recitals as to why the pandemic treaty has been drafted. And they include the following. One, recognizing that the World Health Organization is fundamental to strengthening pandemic prevention preparedness and response, as it is the directing and coordinating authority on international health work. Three, recognizing that the international spread of disease is a global threat with serious consequences for lives, livelihoods, societies and economies that calls for the widest possible international cooperation in an effective, coordinated, appropriate and comprehensive international response, while reaffirming the principles of sovereignty of state parties in addressing public health measures. Six. Recognising the critical role of whole of government and whole of society approaches at country and community levels and the importance of international, regional and cross-regional collaboration, coordination and global solidarity in achieving sustainable improvements in pandemic prevention preparedness and response. Seven, recognising the importance of ensuring political commitment, resourcing and attention across sectors for pandemic prevention preparedness and response. And 13, noting the adoption of the political declaration of the United Nations General Assembly high-level meeting on pandemic prevention preparedness and response during the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly which affirms the need to prioritize equity and respect for human rights and strengthen pandemic prevention preparedness and response capacities have agreed as follows. So as I said the recital section sets out why a document exists. Through the next sections, we will go through what the WHO and the WHA would like to have agreed. Chapter 1, Introduction. Article 1 in Chapter 1 is the use of terms, which is also known as the definition section. This includes definitions such as one health approach, which means an integrated unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimise the health of people, animals and ecosystems. It recognises that the health of humans, domestic and wild animals, plants and the wider environment, including ecosystems, is closely linked and interdependent. The approach mobilises multiple sectors, disciplines and communities at varying levels of society to work together to foster well-being and tackle threats to health and ecosystems while addressing the collective need for clean water, energy and air, safe and nutritious food, taking action on climate change and contributing to sustainable development. The definition section can often be the most important section in a contract or a document because terms that the ordinary man 
might presume to mean one thing have often been defined in a completely different way in a document. And a very good example of that is the definition for One Health approach in the draft pandemic treaty. So what you or I might consider One Health approach to mean would quite likely be limited to the health of people. So it's important to note that any time you see reference to One Health approach in this document, it does not include only reference to human health, but also animal health, plants and the wider environment, such as air, energy, water, food and climate change. The next definition in the draft treaty is pandemic. Pandemic means the global spread of a pathogen or variant that infects human populations with limited or no immunity through sustained and high transmissibility from person to person, overwhelming health systems with severe morbidity and high mortality and causing social and economic disruptions, all of which require effective national and global collaboration and coordination for its control. The next definition that we will look at is universal health coverage, which means that all people have access to the full range of quality health services they need when and where they need them without financial hardship. It covers the full continuum of essential health services from health promotion to prevention, treatment, rehabilitation and palliative care. Article 2 sets out the objective and the scope of the draft treaty. It states the objective of the WHO pandemic agreement, guided by equity, the right to health and the principles and approaches set forth herein, is to prevent, prepare for and respond to pandemics with the aim of comprehensively and effectively addressing the systemic gaps and challenges that exist in these areas at national, regional and international levels. Then it states, very importantly, in furtherance of its objectives, the WHO pandemic agreement applies at all times. Article 3 deals with general principles and approaches and states, to achieve the objective of the WHO pandemic agreement and to implement its provisions, the parties will be guided into a LIA by the guiding principles and approaches set forth below. So these principles and approaches include the following. One, respect for human rights. The implementation of this agreement shall be with the full respect for the dignity, human rights and fundamental freedoms of persons. 2. Sovereignty. States have, in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations and the general principles of international law, the sovereign right to legislate and to implement legislation in pursuance of their health policies. 3. Equity. Equity is at the centre of pandemic prevention, preparedness and response both at the national level within states and at the international level between states. It requires inter alia specific measures to protect persons in vulnerable situations. Equity includes the unhindered, fair, equitable and timely access to safe, effective, quality and affordable pandemic-related products and services, information, pandemic-related technologies and social protection. 4. Responsibility Governments have a responsibility for the health of their peoples and effective pandemic prevention preparedness and response requires global collective action. Six, solidarity. Effective national, international, multilateral, bilateral and multi-sectoral collaboration, coordination and cooperation to achieve the common interest of a safer, fairer, more equitable and better prepared world to prevent, respond to and recover from pandemics. 8. Accountability. States are accountable for strengthening and sustaining their health systems, capacities and public health functions to provide adequate public health and social measures by adopting and implementing legislative, executive, administrative and other measures for fair, equitable, effective and timely pandemic prevention preparedness and response. States are accountable to provide specific measures to protect persons in vulnerable situations. And nine, inclusiveness. The full and active engagement with and participation of communities and relevant stakeholders across all levels consistent with relevant and applicable international and national guidelines, rules and regulations, including those relating to conflicts of interest, is essential to mobilise social capital, resources and adherence to public health 
and social measures and to gain trust in governments and partners supporting pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. So one of the important things to note about this particular section, which talks about respect for human rights and the rights of states to sovereignty, is that these general principles and approaches are said to be guidelines only. On the next page, you can see chapter two, the world together equitably, achieving equity in, for and through pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. So in particular, I want you to pay attention to the difference in different sections between the words shall and should. So the word shall sets out an obligation that you must comply with, whereas the word should sets out a recommendation. It's important to note that when the first draft of the pandemic treaty was issued in February 2023, there was much greater use of the word should in terms of recommending actions that member states should take than there is in the current draft of the pandemic treaty issued on the 30th of October, which includes far more use of the word shall, meaning that this 30th of October version of the pandemic treaty includes far more definitive obligations on state parties. So as you're reading this document, I would recommend that you take cognizance of the use of the word shall throughout. Article 5, One Health states, the parties commit to promote and implement a One Health approach for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response that is coherent, integrated, coordinated and collaborative among all relevant actors with the application of and in accordance with national law. As we stated earlier, One Health approach isn't just limited to human health. It also includes animal health, both domestic and wild, plant health and the wider ecosystem. Article 5.4 states, each party shall in accordance with national context and to the extent necessary protect human, animal and plant health by a. Implementing science-based actions, including but not limited to improving infection prevention and control measures, antimicrobial research and development, and harmonization of surveillance in order to prevent, reduce the risk of and prepare for pandemics. b. Fostering and implementing actions at national and community levels that encompass whole of government and whole of society approaches to control zoonotic outbreaks, including through the engagement of communities in surveillance to identify zoonotic outbreaks. C, taking a One Health approach into account in order to produce science-based evidence, including that which is related to social and behavioral sciences and risk communication and community engagement. And D, promoting or establishing One Health joint training and continuing education programs for human, animal and environmental health workforces needed to build complementary skills, capacities and capabilities to prevent, detect, control and respond to pandemic health threats. So it's important to note that at the start of this Article 5, where it states the parties commit to promote, that's what it says at Article 5.1. However, then under Article 5.4, we have very definitive obligations because it states that each party shall. And in this regard, then it talks about taking a One Health approach into account when improving infection control and prevention, fostering and implementing actions at national and community level, managing whole of government and whole of society approaches, harmonizing surveillance, carrying out research in social and behavioural sciences and also undertaking joint training and education programmes. Article 6 is titled Preparedness, Readiness and Resilience and states that each party shall continue to strengthen its health system, including primary health care for sustainable pandemic prevention, preparedness and response, taking into account the need for equity and resilience with a view to the progressive realisation of universal health coverage. So as we have stated several times throughout this video, the WHO is no longer content with introducing guidelines and recommendations limited to human health. They are also seeking to interfere in animal health, both domestic and wild, plant health, the wider ecosystem, which may include water, energy, air and climate change, 
and now they are also talking about implementing universal health coverage. At this point, any critical thinking person would have to question the extent to which the WHO and the WHA is seeking to extend its remit well outside any area that it was ever given control over in the past. And a follow-on question from this then is, number one, both the level of funding that the WHO would require to manage its new remit, and two, the level of control that apparently sovereign states are handing over to an unelected, unaccountable body. Article 7 deals with health and care workforce and its states. Each party, in line with its respective capacities, shall take the necessary steps to safeguard, protect, invest in and sustain a skilled, trained, competent and committed health and care workforce. To this end, each party shall, in accordance with the national law, b. Address gender and youth disparities and inequalities and security concerns within the public health, health and care workforce, particularly in health emergencies, to support the meaningful representation, engagement, participation, empowerment, safety and well-being of all health and care workers, while addressing discrimination, stigma and inequality, and eliminating bias, including unequal remuneration, and noting that women still face significant barriers to reaching leadership and decision-making roles. So at this point, let us recap on what the WHO, WHA would like to achieve through this pandemic treaty. They're talking about implementing a One Health approach, which would give the WHO, WHA remit over human health, animal health, both domestic and wild, plant health, the wider ecosystem, including air, water, energy, food and climate, introducing universal health coverage. And now they're also talking about introducing gender and youth quotas into healthcare systems. Article 7.2 states, the parties shall commit financial and technical support, assistance and cooperation, in particular in respect of developing countries, in order to strengthen and sustain a skilled and competent public health, health and care workforce at subnational, national and regional levels. Article 7.3 states, the parties shall invest in establishing, sustaining, coordinating and mobilising a skilled and trained multidisciplinary global public health emergency workforce that is deployable to support parties upon request based on public health need in order to contain outbreaks and prevent the escalation of a small scale spread to global proportions. Article 8 is titled Preparedness Monitoring and Functional Reviews. Article 8.4 states, the parties shall establish no later than the 31st of December 2026, a global peer review mechanism to assess pandemic prevention preparedness and response capacities and gaps, as well as levels of readiness, with the aim of promoting and supporting learning amongst parties, best practice, actions and accountability at the national, regional and global levels to strengthen national health emergency preparedness and readiness capacities. Article 9 deals with research and development. Article 10 deals with sustainable production. Article 11 deals with transfer of technology and know-how. I would recommend that you spend some time reviewing these articles in your own time. Article 12 deals with access and benefit sharing. Article 13 deals with global supply chain and logistics network. Article 13 one states, the WHO global supply chain and logistics network is hereby established. The network will operate within the framework of the WHO in partnership and collaboration with relevant international, regional and other organizations and be guided by equity and public health needs, paying particular attention to the needs of developing country parties. The Conference of the Parties shall develop guidelines on modalities and collaboration for the WHO SCL network, which shall be aimed at ensuring close consultation amongst parties and that functions are discharged by the organisations best placed to perform them. Article 13.4 states, each party shall take appropriate measures to reduce waste of pandemic related products including through the exchange and or donation of products 
in order to maximise their use while taking account of the needs of recipient countries. Article 14 deals with regulatory strengthening and states the parties shall strengthen their national and regional regulatory authorities, including through technical assistance, with the aim of expediting regulatory approvals and authorizations and ensuring the quality, safety and efficacy of pandemic related products. Article 14.5 states, each party shall take steps to ensure that it has the legal, administrative and financial frameworks in place to support emergency regulatory approval for the effective and timely regulatory approval of pandemic related products during a pandemic. So you can see this article 14.5 is setting out a requirement to ensure that regulatory approval is given to potentially novel vaccines when a pandemic is declared. Article 15 deals with compensation and liability management and states. Each party shall develop national strategies for managing liability risks in its territory regarding the manufacturing, distribution, administration and use of novel vaccines developed in response to pandemics. Strategies may include the development of model contract provisions, vaccine injury compensation mechanisms, insurance mechanisms, policy frameworks and principles for the negotiation of procurement agreements. Article 15.2 states, the conference of the parties shall establish within two years of the entry into force of the WHO pandemic agreement using existing relevant models as a reference, no fault vaccine injury compensation mechanisms with the aim of promoting access to financial remedy for individuals experiencing severe adverse events resulting from a pandemic vaccine as well as more generally promoting pandemic vaccine acceptance. Article 15.3 states that each party shall endeavour to ensure that in contracts for the supply or purchase of novel pandemic vaccines, buyer recipient indemnity clauses, if any, are exceptionally provided and are time bound. So it's important to note the use of the word endeavour in this clause 15.3. You will notice that pretty much everywhere else that the word shall is used, that there's a positive obligation on a party to do something. So shall establish, shall take appropriate measures, shall strengthen. There's a very big difference between saying a party shall establish something and saying that a party shall endeavour to do something. Noting that the word endeavour means will attempt. So even though the word shall is before it, the word shall has virtually no meaning in this context because all it's saying is you must attempt to do something rather than you must do something. Article 16 is titled International Collaboration and Cooperation and it states, the parties shall promote global, regional and national political commitment, coordination and leadership for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response develop as necessary and implement policies that respect, protect and fulfil the human rights of all people. Promote equitable representation on the basis of gender, geographical and socio-economic status, as well as the equal and meaningful participation of young people and women. And encourage ceasefires in affected countries during pandemics to promote global cooperation against common global threats. So just to recap very briefly again on the areas that the WHO and the WHA are seeking to be given control or remit over. So one, human health. Two, animal health, both domestic and wild. Three, plant health. Four, the wider ecosystem, which may include air, water, energy, food and climate. Five, universal health coverage. Six, introducing gender and youth quotas into the healthcare system. Seven, introducing a global health emergency workforce. Eight, introducing representation quotas, now not just based on gender and youth, but also including geographical and socioeconomic status. And now number nine, becoming involved in what they say is encouraging ceasefires, but which will more than likely involve taking sides in wars. Article 17 is titled Whole of Government and Whole of Society Approaches at the National Level and states, the parties are encouraged to adopt whole of government and whole of society approaches 
including to empower and ensure community ownership of and contribution to community readiness for and resilience to pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. Article 17.3 states, each party shall, in accordance with national context, promote the effective and meaningful engagement of communities, civil society and other relevant stakeholders, including the private sector as part of a whole of society approach in decision making, implementation, monitoring and evaluation, and also shall provide effective feedback opportunities. Article 17.6 states, each party shall take appropriate measures to strengthen national public health and social policies to facilitate a rapid, resilient response to pandemics, especially for persons in vulnerable situations, including by mobilising social capital in communities for mutual support. Article 18 is titled Communication and Public Awareness and states, the parties shall strengthen science, public health and pandemic literacy in the population, as well as access to information on pandemics and their effects and drivers, and combat false, misleading, misinformation or disinformation, including through effective international collaboration and cooperation as referred to in Article 16 herein. Article 18.2 states, the parties shall, as appropriate, conduct research and inform policies on factors that hinder adherence to public health and social measures in a pandemic and trust in science and public health institutions. Article 19 is titled Implementation Capacities and Support. Article 20 is titled Financing and states the following. The parties commit to sustainable financing for strengthening pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. In this regard, each party within the means and resources at its disposal shall cooperate with other parties as appropriate to raise sustainable financial resources for the effective implementation of this agreement through bilateral and multilateral, regional or sub-regional funding mechanisms. Article 20.2 states, a sustainable funding mechanism shall be established by the Conference of the Parties no later than 31st December 2026. This mechanism shall ensure the provisions of adequate, accessible, new and additional and predictable financial resources and shall include the following. A. A capacity development fund that shall be resourced into ALEA through the following. Annual monetary contributions from parties to the WHO pandemic agreement. Monetary contributions from recipients pursuant to Article 12 and voluntary monetary contributions from parties to the WHO pandemic agreement. Chapter 3 Institutional Arrangements and Financial Provisions Article 21 is titled Conference of the Parties and States. A conference of the parties is hereby established. The conference of the parties shall be comprised of delegates representing the parties to the WHO pandemic agreement. Only delegates representing parties will participate in any of the decision making of the conference of the parties. The conference of the parties shall establish the criteria for the participation of observers at its proceedings. Article 21.2 states, with the aim of promoting the coherence of the Conference of the Parties and the Health Assembly, as well as coherence in respect of relevant instruments and mechanisms within the framework of the World Health Organization, the Conference of the Parties shall operate in coordination with the Health Assembly. In particular, the Conference of the Parties shall hold its regular sessions immediately before or after regular sessions of the Health Assembly and in the same location and venue as the Health Assembly where feasible. Article 21.3 states, the first session of the Conference of the Parties shall be convened by the World Health Organization not later than one year after the entry into force of the WHO pandemic agreement. Article 21.7 states, the Conference of the Parties shall keep under regular review the implementation of the WHO pandemic agreement and take the decisions necessary to promote its effective implementation and may adopt, amend, annex and protocols to the WHO pandemic agreement in accordance with Articles 28, 29 and 30 herein. To this end it shall consider reports submitted by the parties in accordance with Article 23 herein and adopt regular reports on the implementation of the WHO pandemic agreement. Article 21.8 states, the conference of the parties shall keep under regular review every three years the implementation and outcome of the WHO pandemic agreement and any related legal instruments that the conference of the parties may adopt 
and shall make decisions necessary to promote the effective implementation of the WHO pandemic agreement. Article 22 is titled Right to Vote and states that each party to the WHO pandemic agreement shall have one vote in the conference of the parties except as provided for in paragraph 2 of this article. Article 23 is titled Reports to the Conference of the Parties and states Each party shall submit to the Conference of the Parties periodic reports on its implementation of the WHO pandemic agreement, which shall include the following. A. Information on good practices, legislative, executive, administrative or other measures taken to implement the WHO pandemic agreement. B. Information on any constraints or difficulties encountered in the implementation of the WHO pandemic agreement and on the measures taken or under consideration to overcome them. Article 24 is titled Secretate. Article 25 is titled Relationship with Other International Agreements and Instruments. Article 26 is titled Reservations. As I said earlier, I would recommend that you read every article in full because it's not possible in this video to cover every section of every article. Article 27 is titled Withdrawal and states the following. At any time after two years from the date on which the WHO pandemic agreement has entered into force for a party, that party may withdraw from the WHO pandemic agreement by giving written notification to the depository. Any such withdrawal shall take effect upon expiry of one year from the date of receipt by the depository of the notification of withdrawal or on such later date as may be specified in the notification of withdrawal. So the important thing to note is even where a party decides that they want to withdraw from the WHO pandemic agreement, the withdrawal takes one year to come into effect from the date of the notification of withdrawal. Article 28 is titled Amendments and states any party may propose amendments to the WHO pandemic agreement. Such amendments shall be considered by the conference of the parties. And Article 28.3 states the parties shall make every effort to adopt any proposed amendment to the WHO pandemic agreement by consensus. If all efforts at consensus have been exhausted and no agreement has been reached, the amendment shall as a last resort be adopted by a three quarters majority vote of the parties present and voting at the session. For the purposes of this article, parties present and voting means parties present and casting an affirmative or negative vote. Any adopted amendment shall be communicated by the secretary to the depository who shall circulate it to all parties for acceptance. So again, it's important to note that once the WHO pandemic agreement is agreed by the parties, and signed into law. If a party wants to withdraw from that agreement, they can't do so for the first two years after the agreement has entered into force. And thereafter, should a party submit a notification of withdrawal, it would take one year for that notification to be effective. And during that time, parties can propose amendments to the WHO pandemic agreement that a member state or a member party may not be in agreement with. And what this Article 28 Amendment states is that although efforts will be made to reach agreement on proposed amendments to the WHO pandemic agreement, if agreement cannot be reached through consensus, a three quarters majority vote of the parties present and voting will be considered legally binding. Article 29 deals with the annexes. Article 30 deals with the protocols. Article 31 deals with signatures and states the following. The WHO pandemic agreement shall be open for signature by all members of the World Health Organization, by states that are not members of the World Health Organization, but are members or non-member observers states of the United Nations, and by regional economic integration organizations. Thereafter, Article 31 signature goes on to state, the WHO pandemic agreement shall be open for signature at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva, immediately following its adoption by the World Health Assembly at the 77th World Health Assembly from X date in May 2024 to the X date of June 2024, and thereafter at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Article 32 is titled Ratification, Acceptance, Approval, Formal Confirmation or Accession, and states the following. The WHO pandemic agreement shall be subject to ratification, acceptance, approval or accession by states and to formal confirmation or accession by regional economic integration organisations. The WHO pandemic agreement shall be open for accession from the day after the date on which the WHO pandemic agreement is closed for signature. 
Instruments of ratification, acceptance, approval, formal confirmation or accession shall be deposited with the depository. Article 33 is titled Entry into Force. Article 34 is titled Settlement of Disputes. Article 35 is titled Depository. Article 36 is titled Authentic Texts. And that concludes the initial review of the draft pandemic treaty. In this next section, what I wanted to do was just look at some points of note on the draft pandemic treaty. So the first comment that I wanted to make was that before this draft treaty that we're looking at, which was issued on the 30th of October 2023, there was prior to that the zero draft treaty, which was published in February 2023. The zero draft treaty stated that the pandemic treaty should be legally binding and contain both legally binding as well as non-legally binding elements. In this regard, you should note sections that state should versus shall and use of words such as encourage. It's important to note that this particular wording where it was stating legally binding versus non-legally binding has actually been removed from the 30th of October 2023 version. However, words should and shall continue to be used. However, the word shall is now in far greater use. And while this may be viewed as a negative for most other countries, given that the word shall means must, the use of the word shall may actually be viewed as a positive to Ireland in requiring a referendum. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. It's also important to note that it's intended that the pandemic treaty will be adopted using either Article 19 or 21 of the WHO Constitution. The first page of the draft treaty reads, Recognising that the international spread of disease is a global threat with serious consequences for lives, livelihoods, societies and economies that calls for the widest possible international cooperation in an effective, coordinated, appropriate and comprehensive international response while reaffirming the principles of sovereignty of state parties in addressing public health matters. So it's important to note that there are several references to sovereignty throughout the draft pandemic treaty. And this is an obvious attempt to counter any suggestion of a loss of sovereignty resulting from acceptance of the pandemic treaty. Now, it's obviously very clever of the WHO and the WHA to be seen to be tackling a loss of sovereignty up front by saying that state parties do not lose sovereignty. But if you look at the actual text of the draft treaty littered throughout it, is positive obligation on state parties in every area where it says the state party shall do something. So the difficulty here is that it's very easy for the WHO and the WHA to point to particular clauses stating in this document it states that sovereignty is not being overruled or diminished. Whereas for the average man to realise that it is actually being diminished and overruled, that person would need to read through the entire pandemic treaty and recognise that the word shall includes a positive obligation on member states and state parties to do X, Y and Z. Under Article 3, General Principles and Approaches, it also states... To achieve the objectives of the WHO pandemic agreement and to implement its provisions, the parties will be guided by the general principles and approaches set forth below. And you can see that number two here again is sovereignty and it states, States have, in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations and the general principles of international law, the sovereign right to legislate and to implement legislation in pursuance of their health policies. What the WHO and the WHA will not be quick to point out is that these are only general principles and approaches. And you will note that it says that to achieve the objective of the WHO pandemic agreement, the parties will be guided, whereas in other sections of the document, it says the parties shall. Again, Article 3 under general principles and approaches states under solidarity, Effective national, international, multilateral, bilateral and multisectoral collaboration, coordination and cooperation to achieve the common interest of a safer, fairer, more equitable and better prepared world to prevent, respond to and recover from pandemics. Now, if you're a person living in Ireland, you may be familiar with the term the common good. And it's my view that the term the common interest is the same as the common good under the Irish constitution, 
meaning that the interest of the collective should outweigh the interest of the individual. And in my view, this is never a good outcome. You should also note continuous reference to language like equity and equitable in furtherance of the aim of diversity, equity and inclusion policies. Noting that this type of language is now commonly used across all governments in furtherance of the New World Order agenda items. Section 9 deals with inclusivity and states. The full and active engagement with and participation of communities and relevant stakeholders across all levels, consistent with relevant and applicable international and national guidelines, rules and regulations, including those relating to conflicts of interest, is essential to mobilise social capital resources and adherence to public health and social measures and to gain trust in governments and partners. So we saw throughout the COVID-19 pandemic that social capital, which you can also refer to as emotional blackmail and shame, was utilised to encourage compliance of measures that would otherwise have been rejected. And the term social capital is used several times throughout this draft pandemic treaty. Article 5, 1 Health states, each party shall, in accordance with national context and to the extent necessary, protect human, animal and plant health by fostering and implementing actions at national and community levels that encompass whole of government and whole of society approaches. And taking a One Health approach into account in order to produce science-based evidence, including that which is related to social and behavioural sciences. So in relation to whole of society approaches and whole of government approaches, this will be achieved by utilising social capital, meaning through emotional blackmail and stigmatisation against anyone who challenges the narrative. And in relation to behavioural science, behavioural science was used throughout COVID-19 to influence people's behaviour. That's why messaging like my mask protects you was so powerful and impactful because most people seek the approval of others and are therefore willing to conform to social norms that they may not agree with or believe in just to fit in. Also, another way that governments and media leverage the impact of social norms falls under a heading called nudges. Nudges can influence behaviour because people are highly reactive to choices made by others, especially choices made by people they trust. So a message that suggests a majority of people believe in something or are doing something can be compelling. An example would be a message that reads, the overwhelming majority of people in your community believe that everyone should stay home. The point that I am making is that as part of this One Health approach, the WHO and the WHA are encouraging the use of social and behavioural sciences to increase compliance among the public. Article 15 deals with compensation and liability management and states that parties shall develop national strategies for managing liability risks, which may include the introduction of vaccine injury compensation mechanisms and that the point behind introducing such mechanisms is twofold. One, to provide financial remedies for individuals experiencing serious adverse events and two, and probably more relevant, to ensure vaccine acceptance and promotion. In relation to vaccine injury compensation schemes, globally 25 jurisdictions currently have vaccine injury compensation schemes, 16 of which are currently in Europe. And although Ireland does not currently have such a scheme, the government have been discussing establishing a scheme for the past several years. Article 17, whole of government and whole of society approaches states, the parties are encouraged to adopt whole of government and whole of society approaches, including to empower and ensure community ownership of and contribution to community readiness. And that each party shall promote the effective and meaningful engagement of communities, civil society and other relevant stakeholders, including the private sector. So one of the things that we saw throughout the COVID-19 pandemic was that in many cases, the guards did not have to police the behaviour of others because to a certain extent, in utilising the media in particular, the government was successful in achieving a whole of society approach towards the policing of neighbour against neighbour. And in my view, that's what this Article 17 is seeking to achieve. 
Article 18 is titled Communication and Public Awareness and talks about strengthening pandemic literacy in the population and combating false misleading misinformation or disinformation and also carrying out research on factors that hinder adherence to public health and social measures and increase trust in science and public health institutions. Again, we saw throughout the COVID-19 pandemic that only certain information was allowed to reach the public and any information that went against the narrative was banned particularly from social media platforms. This Article 18 is seeking to strengthen and reinforce the measures that were developed and adopted throughout the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that only the information the governments and the media want to be released to the public is released to the public. In summary, one of the greatest problems that we're going to have with educating the average man as to the dangers of this treaty is that the treaty says everything to those in the know, but nothing to those outside of the know. And this is obviously by design. An example of this would be where the treaty specifically states in numerous areas that member states and states parties will not suffer a loss of sovereignty. And including language like that within the document allows the WHO, the WHA, governments and media to point members of the public directly to those sections, while at the same time disregarding the fact that the treaty specifically says countless times that state parties shall do X, Y and Z, meaning that state parties have a positive obligation and will have agreed to do certain things by signing up to this treaty, which in turn will mean that they have a loss of sovereignty. The pandemic treaty appears to be dealing with those issues up front and resolving any concern. So my advice in trying to educate the average man would suggest that you don't focus solely on issues like sovereignty, but you also try to explain that the WHO and the WHA is seeking to extend its remit well outside of anything that anybody would consider as human health. And in this regard, you could point the average man to the following facts. Within the WHO pandemic treaty, the WHO and the WHA are seeking to extend their remit to include the following. One, human health. Two, animal health, both domestic and wild. Three, plant health. Four, the wider ecosystem, which may include air, water, energy, food, and climate. Five, the introduction of universal health coverage. Six, the introduction of gender and youth quotas into the healthcare systems. Seven, introducing a global health emergency workforce. Eight, introducing representation quotas, not only based on gender and age, but also based on geographical and socioeconomic status. Nine, becoming involved in encouraging ceasefires which in reality may actually mean taking sides in wars. And 10, combating false or misleading information, which quite often leads to censorship. That concludes our review of the draft treaty published on the 30th of October, 2023. As we go through the next section, which is a review of the report of the review committee regarding amendments to the international health regulations, you will see that there is a significant overlap between the agenda set out in the pandemic treaty and the amendments proposed to the international health regulations. The reason that I'm pointing this out is it is as important that the pandemic treaty fails as it is that the amendments to the international health regulations fail too. Next, we will look at section four, which is a review of the report of the review committee regarding amendments to the international health regulations 2005. So as you can see from the document on the screen, the current report was published on the 6th of February, 2023, and it's listed as the provisional agenda item number four at the second meeting of the working group on amendments to the international health regulations. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see the table of contents, and I've just highlighted certain areas for review. So the first section is introduction and background. The second section is methods of work. The third section is general consideration regarding the proposed amendments. And under that, we have issues such as trust and transparency, sovereignty, surveillance, countering misinformation and disinformation, accountability, compliance and implementation. And part four is article by article review and technical recommendations. 
In particular, under this article by article review, I wanted to highlight the health documents, which include certificate of vaccination status. So at the start of the document, after the acknowledgements, it states the following. We are over three years into a pandemic that is unprecedented in our lifetime, with an estimated global toll of 15 million excess deaths and wide ranging and continuing impacts throughout societies. The international community has learned a great deal about how the international health regulations function in a public health emergency of international concern of historic proportions. The COVID-19 pandemic revealed deep inadequacies in the global health architecture at the national and global levels, including shortcomings of the regulations. We recognise that state parties are also engaged in a parallel process of drafting and negotiating a WHO pandemic agreement. Yet the international health regulations are currently the only near universal instrument for global health security that the world has. That is why bold and effective reforms to the regulations are so vital, as is coordination between the two negotiating processes. We wish to leave senior decision making with a singular message. Focus on the fundamentals. Capture this unique moment of possibility. Be bold in thinking and in action. Develop and prioritise amendments to the international health regulations that will fundamentally improve global public health protection and help create a more equal, just and resilient world and a better prepared one. We urge state parties to assess proposed amendments by considering their effectiveness as the most important guiding consideration. That is, ask yourselves and each other, how can amended international health regulations materially advance the goals of prevention, preparedness and response in a manner that leaves no one behind. In this report, the committee has identified key shared values that underpin the proposed amendments to the regulations being one, equity, solidarity and international cooperation, two, trust and transparency and three, sovereignty. Building on these values, the chairs and vice chair offer the following blueprint. The document goes on to state the following seven areas. One, strengthen health system capacities for better preparedness. Two, leave no one behind. Three, align incentives for international cooperation. Four, ensure early and accurate notification. Five, promote the full sharing of scientific information. Six, embed principles of good governance. And seven, improve implementation of and compliance with the international health regulations. In relation to seven, it states, strengthening implementation of and compliance with the regulations is vital to the success of any reform. While states' failures to give full effect to the regulations may have been most extensive during COVID-19, they have occurred since the regulations were first adopted. The amended regulations should seek to encourage and facilitate implementation and compliance. If we fail to act now in fundamentally strengthening the international health regulations, the consequences may be severe. History will look to these negotiations and WHO member states' willingness to prevent or at least better manage another global tragedy like COVID-19, the impacts of which could have been reduced with robust and effective national responses supported by international legal instruments and institutions. The global community demands bold action from the world's governments to advance collective health security and equity through revisions to the international health regulations. Such bold actions will help keep future generations safer, promote equity and human rights and advance social and economic prosperity. State parties and WHO must then rise to meet the moment and make the international health regulations fit for purpose in the 21st century. So the first area that we're going to look at as part of this review of the report of the review committee is the section titled Sovereignty. This section states the following. Article 3 of the international health regulations recognises that States have, in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations and the principles of international law, the sovereign right to legislate and to implement legislation in pursuance of their health policies. In doing so, they should uphold the purpose of these regulations. Many other provisions of the regulations similarly embed, either implicitly or explicitly, respect and recognition for the sovereignty of state parties 
including articles related to notification, reporting and response to public health events that are of respect and recognition for the sovereignty of state parties, including articles related to notification, reporting and response to public health events that are or may constitute a public health event of international concern. Although the proposed amendments do not explicitly reference sovereignty, assessments of proposed amendments will depend upon their implications for the sovereignty of state parties. Some proposed amendments show an increasing understanding of shared and mutual responsibilities. The sovereignty of state parties remains foundational to the regulations. As with the revisions nearly 20 years ago that led to the international health regulations, proposed amendments to them will require careful balancing between a state party's sovereign right to take the actions necessary to protect its population against a public health risk while recognising their mutual vulnerabilities and responsibilities and the imperative of international cooperation and solidarity which are key enablers of effective regulations. The committee considers that the international framework for prevention, preparing for and responding to public health risks is most effective when individual states are strengthened to perform their duties with shared trust and responsibility as sovereign parties to and custodians of the regulations. The values mentioned above should be regarded as complementary rather than opposing elements of regulations that are fit to counter contemporary public health risks. So once again, as with the pandemic treaty, the amendments to the international health regulations and this report of the review committee is trying to deal with the issue of loss of sovereignty up front. And what the report is saying is that although the proposed amendments do not specifically reference sovereignty, the proposed amendments can actually have an impact on sovereignty. Again, the report, no more than the pandemic treaty, is very clever in being seen to be dealing with the issue of loss of sovereignty up front. But as in the case of the pandemic treaty, the devil is in the detail. So although the report of the review committee states that state parties are entitled to their sovereignty, whether or not the sovereignty of state parties is actually respected will come down to the individual amendments accepted to the international health regulations. The second area that we will look at under the report of the review committee is under the title Digital Information and Data Protection. This section states, traditionally health documents including certificates and other data shared under the regulations have been in paper form. Many state parties are moving towards digitised data which can improve authenticity, accuracy and efficiency as well as facilitate exchange among national authorities. Several proposed amendments address health documentation and their digitization. This might include, for example, the Maritime Health Declaration or Passenger Certificates and Vaccination Documents. The next area that we will look at is Countering Misinformation and Disinformation. This section states, during the COVID-19 pandemic, multiple sources of inaccurate, spurious information and disinformation from a range of political, social and cultural sources hindered a meaningful public health response. Misinformation and disinformation can also undermine public trust in health agencies and impede public confidence in and compliance with governmental or WHO guidance. In particular, the rapid growth of anti-vaccination messages promulgated through social media posed a significant challenge to managing the associated response. A balance is needed between ensuring more accurate scientific information on the one hand and freedom of speech and the press on the other. How to strike that balance while navigating global policy and national regulatory landscapes will be an ongoing challenge. The committee also suggests that the Working Group on Amendments to the International Health Regulations might consider how misinformation and disinformation may relate to obligations for WHO to verify information coming from sources other than states' parties. The section titled Accountability, Compliance and Implementation states the following. Three newly proposed articles introduce provisions relating to strengthening compliance with the regulations, improving their overall implementation and holding state parties accountable for that. The challenge remains how best to implement compliance and accountability mechanisms to ensure that state parties are able to meet their obligations and build mutual trust, as well as promote an effective and equitable implementation of the regulations. 
So to review the next section, what I have done is I have extracted some of the proposed amendments to the international health regulations, which you can see on the left hand side of the screen. And I've included my comments on the right hand side of the screen. So if we're talking about the 2005 international health regulations, those particular regulations have a limited scope and do not impinge significantly on the sovereignty of states and their ability and right to make domestic decisions regarding the health of their peoples. However, the 2023 proposed amendments that we're going to be reviewing in the next section have the potential to change all of that. So the first proposed amendment that we will look at is in the definition section. So you can see on the proposed amendment section, it says standing recommendation and temporary recommendation. And you can see the words non-binding have been struck through in both of them. So these two amendments propose to delete the words non-binding from the definitions of both standing recommendations and temporary recommendations. And if these amendments are agreed, this would mean that the director general who before could only issue non-binding temporary recommendations would be instead able to potentially issue mandatory and legally binding advice. The second proposed amendment is under Article 2, Scope and Purpose. So the words that you can see there that are in bold and underlined, they're new additional words that some state parties are proposing to introduce into the regulations. And you can also see that the words public health risk have been struck through. So the scope and the purpose of the International Health Regulations 2005 was limited to public health risks. But this amendment seeks to expand the scope to include all risks with the potential to impact on public health. So this language is both vague and broad and especially concerning are the words all and potential, noting that such language could result in issues such as climate change being introduced into the scope and purpose of the International Health Regulations given the constant reference to climate change having an impact on public health. Also, if we consider the definition for One Health approach under the pandemic treaty, you will recall how far reaching it was and that it included not just human health, but also animal health, plant health and the wider ecosystem. So to suggest that the exclusion of the words public health risk is intended to expand the scope of the WHO and the WHA is not conspiratorial. So the next article we will look at is Article 3 Principles. From the document on the screen, you can see that the words with full respect for the dignity, human rights and fundamental freedoms of persons has been deleted and it has been replaced instead with buzzwords such as equity and inclusivity. So what this proposed amendment is seeking to do is to delete the positive obligation and the current obligation under the 2005 International Health Regulations to have respect for dignity, human rights and fundamental freedoms of persons. Let that sink in. The next article we will look at is Article 5, Surveillance. So you can see here on the left hand side of the screen where it says new paragraph five and then down below you can also see a second new paragraph five. So these are two different forms of wording that have been proposed by different state bodies. So in essence what they both suggest is that the WHO would create early warning criteria for assessing risks posed by events including isolated national events. Article 8 consultation would require state parties to keep the WHO up to date on events which previously, due to lack of sufficient information, did not require notification. Article 9 under other reports includes one of the significant amendments proposed to the International Health Regulations. This amendment seeks to delete the requirement for the WHO to consult with a state party regarding an event where the WHO has sourced information regarding an event other than from the state party or through an official notification. The next proposed amendment we will look at is under Article 12, Determination of a Public Health Emergency of International Concern, Public Health Emergency of Regional Concern or Intermediate Health Alert. So you can see the words underlined and in bold Public Health Emergency of Regional Concern or Intermediate Health Alert. So these are additional words that it is proposed to include in Article 12. So the amendments to this Article 12 seek to allow the Director General to intervene in events that have a potential 
to result in a health emergency. Furthermore, in circumstances where the Director General determines that a health emergency of international concern is occurring, he would no longer have to seek agreement from the state party in whose territory the event was occurring. So there are two very significant things happening here. One, that the Director General could now intervene in events that have a potential to result in a health emergency. And second of all, that he would no longer have to seek agreement from a sovereign state party in whose territory the event was occurring as to whether or not that event actually constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. It's very hard to see how anybody considering this wording from an objective perspective would conclude that this would not interfere with the sovereignty of a state. Then again, under this Article 12, you can see that there are three new paragraphs being proposed. So the proposed new paragraphs seek to give the Director General the authority to give heightened international awareness to an event and circumstances where the event has been determined not to meet the criteria for a public health emergency. These new paragraphs would also give the Director General the authority to communicate the fact that he believes an event has the potential to develop into a public health emergency, even where the emergency committee has not designated the event as being a public health emergency. In this regard, it is worth remembering that across the world, states accepted and lifted public health measures in or around February and March of 2022, whereas the WHO declared an end to COVID-19 as a global health emergency only in May 2023. So it's fair to say that if the Director General of the WHO was to be given the remit to give heightened international awareness to an event that does not meet the criteria for a public health emergency, that he would quite likely flex this muscle in circumstances where it is not warranted. And the basis for this assertion is, as I just said, that governments throughout the world lifted the public health measures surrounding COVID-19 in or about February, March of 2022, whereas the WHO did not declare an end to COVID-19 as a global health emergency until May of 2023. The next article that we will look at is Article 13, Public Health Response. So where previously a state party would ask for assistance and enter into a collaborative relationship with the WHO, this amendment would allow the WHO to offer unsolicited assistance to a state party and require that state party to provide reasons for the rejection of any such assistance. Again, I ask you how this could be seen as not interfering with the sovereignty of a state. Also, the second proposed amendment to Article 13 would require a state party to evaluate its response to a public health emergency on the basis of the impact this response might have on another state party, thereby diminishing the ability of a state party to prioritise the well-being of its people. Again, I ask you how this would not impact on the sovereignty of a state. The next article we will look at is New Article 13a, which is WHO-led international public health response. These amendments would mandate that state parties adhere to recommendations of the WHO. Furthermore, these amendments would allow the WHO to prioritise certain categories of person to receive health products in advance of others. So you will recall at the start of this section, section four, when we were talking about proposed amendments to the international health regulations, we looked at proposed amendments to the definition section of standing order and temporary order. And you'll note that the sections non-binding in both of those definitions were deleted. And as we said, if those amendments were agreed, this would mean that the Director General, who could only before issue non-binding temporary recommendations, would instead potentially be able to issue mandatory legally binding advice. So under this new Article 13a, when we are talking about state parties having to adhere to recommendations, be careful in thinking that those recommendations are not legally binding. Article 15 temporary recommendations state that 
recommendations issued should be mandatory and include surveillance, medical countermeasures, which is quite vague and broad, and other requisite health measures. Again, vague and broad. Article 18 recommendations with respect to persons, baggage cargo containers, conveyances, goods and postal parcels. So you can see the last bullet point under this section 2 states, ensure mechanisms to develop and apply a traveller's health declaration in international public health emergency of international concern to provide better information about travel itinerary, possible symptoms that could be manifested or other prevention measures that have been complied with, such as facilitation of contact tracing if necessary. So this amendment seeks to empower the WHO to issue recommendations. Remember, again, recommendations, they've taken out the words non-binding to introduce a traveller's health declaration. Article 23, health measures on arrival and departure. This amendment would empower state parties to seek testing and vaccination passports when traveling internationally. Now, we know one of the main reasons that they want to amend the international health regulations is to include a statutory footing to introduce testing and vaccination passports that could be rolled out at any time. The next amendment that we will look at is Article 36, Certificates of Vaccination and Other Prophylactics. This amendment would empower state parties to seek testing and recovery passports when traveling internationally, thereby normalizing the production of medical information for international travel. Article 43, additional health measures. This amendment would empower the WHO to make recommendations. Again, remember that they want to remove the term non-binding from the definition regarding additional health measures that a state party may decide to take where previously the WHO could only request or offer advice in this respect. Also, the second paragraph seeks to make any recommendation final upon appeal to the Emergency Committee. The final proposed amendment that we will look at is to Article 44, Collaboration and Assistance. This amendment seeks to ensure collaboration between state parties to counter the dissemination of false and unreliable information, including through social networks. This would inevitably lead to the censorship of information with which the WHO and their funders did not agree with, as was the case during COVID-19, irrespective of whether that information was true or false. As discussed at the start of this section, you can see that there is a considerable amount of overlap between the draft pandemic treaty and amendments proposed to the international health regulations. Some of those areas of overlap include trying to diminish the loss of sovereignty of state parties by addressing the issue up front in both the pandemic treaty and in the report of the review committee to the international health regulations. Introducing increased surveillance. Introducing the concept of equity overhauling the funding mechanisms for the WHO, extending the remit of the WHO from just human health to include other areas such as animal health, plant health and the wider ecosystem. Also expanding the WHO's remit into areas that would facilitate censorship of information while labelling it as countering disinformation. You will recall that earlier in this video, I mentioned the level of cooperation and collaboration happening between the intergovernmental negotiating body who is looking at the pandemic treaty and the review committee who are looking at the amendments to the international health regulations. And I would hope you agree that it's clear to see that there is a significant amount of overlap between the pandemic treaty and the proposed amendments to the international health regulations, such that both documents will complement and strengthen each other's positions. And for this reason, we need to be sure that we concentrate on both because if the pandemic treaty is not passed, but the amendments to the international health regulations are, the situation will be dire. And if the amendments to the international health regulations are not passed and the pandemic treaty is passed, again, the situation will be dire. The point that I am making is just to ask that you do not take your focus off either. So the next section that we will look at is section five, which is the next steps regarding the adoption of the pandemic treaty. On the screen, you can see the updated timeline and deliverables for the intergovernmental negotiating body starting from its third meeting. 
So at this point, all we are focused on is the right hand side of the screen. And the next meeting of the INB is due to take place on the 19th of February, which is the eighth meeting of the INB. And at this meeting, they will continue to discuss the draft pandemic treaty that was issued on the 30th of October 2023 and continue to prepare for the final report for the 77th World Health Assembly meeting in May 2024. After the 19th of February meeting, the next meeting commences on the 18th of March and this will be the ninth meeting of the INB and at this point they are looking to come to a consensus text for the pandemic treaty and the finalisation of the report to be submitted to the 77th World Health Assembly. And then you can see the very last point is May 2024 which is the meeting of the World Health Assembly where the pandemic treaty is due to be voted on. The next section that we will look at, section six, are the next steps regarding the adoption of amendments to the international health regulations. So the timetable of the working group was updated on the 16th of November 2023. And the next meeting of the working group is due to take place on the 5th of February 2024. That will be their seventh meeting. And then the eighth meeting of the working group is due to take place on the 22nd to the 26th of April 2024. And then you can see the final point on this timetable on the 27th of May to the 1st of June 2024 is the 77th World Health Assembly meeting. It's my understanding that the working group is behind on their schedule and that's why it was necessary to update this timetable on the 16th of November last. So it may be the case that only a certain number of the proposed amendments to the international health regulations may be pushed to the World Health Assembly in May 2024 as it may be the case that the working group does not have all of the proposed amendments ready for discussion and voting at that time. Section 7. Ireland, the law and the adoption of the pandemic treaty and amendments to the international health regulations. As stated throughout this video, at the 77th World Health Assembly meeting, which is due to take place in May 2024, the following will occur. The Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, the INB, will present its final proposed draft of the pandemic treaty and the working group will present its final proposed amendments to the International Health Regulations 2005. And at this meeting in May 2024, we expect that the WHA will vote on both of these issues. So under this section seven, what we're going to look at first is the process for adoption of the pandemic treaty and amendments to the International Health Regulations at the WHO WHA level. So on the left hand side of the screen, you can see process for adoption of the pandemic treaty. We'll look at that first. So the WHA has confirmed that the pandemic treaty could be adopted using either Article 19 or 21 of the WHO Constitution. If it's Article 19 that's used, a two thirds majority of the WHA is necessary for the adoption of any convention or agreement. And thereafter, each member would have to accept the convention or agreement in accordance with its constitutional processes. Under Article 19, any treaty or convention would need to be accepted. So that's the first option, Article 19. However, if the pandemic treaty is adopted using Article 21, any such regulations adopted under Article 21 shall come into force for all members after due notice has been given of their adoption by the Health Assembly, except for members as may notify the Director General of rejection or reservation within the period stated in the notice. So under Article 21, any treaty or convention would have to be rejected or a reservation issued. So under Article 19, states would have to accept it. Under Article 21, they would have to reject it. Also, it's worth noting that the draft treaty at Article 27 withdrawal states that at any time after two years from the date on which the treaty has entered into force, a party may withdraw from the treaty by giving written notification, which will take effect after one year. So that's the process for adoption of the pandemic treaty through the WHO. The process for adoption of amendments to the international health regulations are as follows. Article 21 of the WHO constitution provides that the health assembly shall have the authority to adopt regulations concerning a sanitary and quarantine requirements and other procedures designed to prevent the international spread of disease. B nomenclatures with respect to disease, cause of death and public health practices. C. Standards with respect to diagnostic procedures for international use. D. Standards with respect to the safety, purity and potency of biological, pharmaceutical and similar products moving in international commerce. And E. Advertising and labelling of biological, pharmaceutical and similar products moving in international commerce. 
So Article 21 sets out the areas where the Health Assembly has the authority to adopt regulations. Article 22 of the WHO Constitution provides that regulations adopted pursuant to Article 21 shall come into force for all members after due notice has been given of their adoption by the Health Assembly, except for such members as may notify the Director General of Rejection or Reservation within the period stated in the notice. So where the amendments are accepted by the World Health Assembly, a state party would have to specifically reject the amendments under Article 22. Article 59, entry into force, period for rejection or reservation of the international health regulations provides that the period provided for rejection or revocation as set out in Article 22 of the WHO Constitution is 18 months, noting that this has been reduced to 12 months from the date of notification by the Director General of any amendments to the international health regulations. So, as we stated earlier, if the pandemic treaty is adopted using Article 19, state parties would have to specifically accept the treaty. However, if it's adopted using Article 21, state parties would have to specifically reject it. And if the international health regulations are passed by the Health Assembly, state parties would have to specifically reject those amendments. And we can see from the right hand side of the screen that the period for rejection has been reduced from 18 months to 12 months. So that was one of the changes that were made to the international health regulations in May 2022 under Article 59. Under this section 7, the next area that we will look at is the adoption of the pandemic treaty and amendments to the international health regulations in an Irish context. So the Constitution sets down a number of requirements that must be followed whenever an international agreement is being concluded. And the Pandemic Treaty and the amendments to the International Health Regulations constitute an international agreement under the Irish Constitution. Article 29.4.1 of the Constitution provides that the conclusion of an international agreement is an exercise of the executive power of the state in connection with its external relations and as such, any such agreement is concluded by or on the authority of the government. Note that executive authority is exercised by the cabinet, known simply as the government. The government is the group of senior ministers responsible for the executive power of the state. And Article 28 of the Constitution states that the government may consist of no less than seven and no more than 15 members, namely the Taoiseach, the Tánaiste and up to 13 other ministers. Article 29.5.1 of the Constitution provides that every international agreement to which the state becomes a party shall be laid before Dáil Éireann. You should note, however, that this is after the fact. And Article 29.5.2 of the Constitution confirms that the terms of all international agreements which impose a charge on public funds and are not of a technical and administrative character must be approved by Dáil Éireann prior to the government agreeing to the state to be bound by it. I know that some of those references to the Constitution, that it may not be that easy to understand the step-by-step -step process for the adoption of an international agreement. So on the screen, I have set out a step-by-step -step process in the hope that this will make it easier to understand. So step one, the treaty or the international agreement is approved and accepted by the World Health Assembly. Ireland operates under a dualist system, meaning that both international and domestic arrangements need to be made for any treaty or international agreement to become part of both international and domestic law. This is by virtue of Article 29.6 of the Constitution. Step 2. If the terms of the treaty would impose a charge on public funds, then in accordance with Standing Order 187 of Dáil Éireann and Article 29.5.2 of the Constitution, a formal motion is made to Dáil Éireann seeking approval of the terms of the treaty and if approval is secured then we move on to step three. The government would agree in principle to the contents of the treaty by signing the treaty in accordance with Article 29.4.1 noting that such signing is taken to be conditional on later ratification or accession. However, once agreement in principle has been given, Ireland would be required to act in good faith to avoid any breach of the treaty, noting that this good faith agreement is not legally enforceable. Then we move on to step four, where the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade or others will usually carry out an audit of existing domestic legislation to determine to what extent additional legislation is required to comply with the treaty provisions. Step five, if legislation is required, this will be drafted and passed by the Oireachtas and signed into law by the president in the usual way. Once any necessary legislation is passed, a further government decision authorising ratification will be required. Step 7. When the state has consented to be bound by a treaty and it has entered into force, 
It is then laid before Dáil Éireann in accordance with Article 29.5.1 of the Constitution. Finally, Step 8. Following the laying of a treaty or international agreement before Dáil Éireann, notification of their entry into force for the state is published in the State Gazette, Iris Ifigul, and they are also published in the Irish Treaty Series. So that is the step-by-step -step guide. If the treaty or international agreement would impose a charge on public funds, which in all likelihood the pandemic treaty and amendments to the international health regulations will. So on the right-hand side of the screen, we start from step two. So if the terms of the treaty would not impose a charge on public funds, the government would agree in principle to the content of the treaty by signing the treaty in accordance with Article 29.4.1 of the Constitution, noting that such signing is taken to be conditional on later ratification or accession. Step 3. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade or others will usually carry out an audit of existing domestic legislation to determine to what extent additional legislation is required to comply with the treaty provisions. Step 4. If legislation is required, this will be drafted and passed by the Oireachtas and signed into law by the President in the usual way. Step 5. Once any necessary legislation is passed, a further government decision authorising ratification will be required. Step 6. When the state has consented to be bound by the treaty and it has entered into force, it's laid before Dáil Éireann in accordance with Article 29.5.1 of the Constitution. And Step 7. Following the laying of the treaty before Dáil Éireann, notification of its entry into force into the State Gazette is published and they're also published in the Irish Treaty Series. In relation to whether or not this international agreement or treaty would need to be put to the people, Willie O'D TD put the following question to the Minister for Health on the 10th of May 2022. The question put was, Deputy Willie O'D asked the Minister for Health if he is satisfied the proposed World Health Organization Global Pandemic Treaty should be signed by Ireland without first consulting with the people of Ireland. If he is satisfied that this proposed treaty will comply with the Irish Constitution and if the matter will be discussed in the Houses of the Oireachtas in advance of any possible signing of the proposed treaty and if he will make a statement on the matter. The written response from the Minister for Health stated, As provided for in the Constitution, the conclusion of an international agreement is an exercise of the executive power of the state in connection with its external relations and is therefore concluded by or on the authority of the government. In practice, this means that government approval must be sought for the signature, ratification or approval of every international agreement. As the proposed instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response is currently in the very early stages of negotiation, it is not possible at this time to determine the precise legal ramifications of the instrument, nor has it been determined what form the instrument shall take. The requirements of the Irish Constitution will, of course, be respected in Ireland's position towards the negotiations, and my department will engage with the Office of the Attorney General in relation to any concerns that may arise in this regard. So, in this answer, the Minister for Health is stating that because we do not know the final format and content of the pandemic treaty, it is not or was not possible in May 2022 to advise whether or not a referendum would be required before the Irish government could accept the pandemic treaty. The last section that we're going to look at in this video is Section 8, Avenues to Challenge the Adoption of the Pandemic Treaty and Amendments to the International Health Regulations. So in relation to a challenge at an Irish level, there are two types of referendum that can be held in Ireland, a constitutional referendum or an ordinary referendum. In relation to a constitutional referendum, Article 46 of the Constitution sets out the rules for how the Constitution can be amended. Article 47 sets out the basic rules for referendums. For a constitutional referendum, a bill is first introduced in the Dáil, setting out the wording of the proposed amendment. If both the Dáil and the Shannon pass the bill, the Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage makes an order specifying the polling day for the referendum. In addition to a constitutional referendum, it's also possible to hold an ordinary referendum. An ordinary referendum is one that does not relate to amending the Constitution. To date, no ordinary referendum has ever been held in Ireland. An ordinary referendum would take place if the President received a joint petition from both Houses of the Oireachtas. 
The petition would say that a proposed bill was of such national importance that the people of Ireland should decide whether it became law. The joint petition must be passed by the majority of the members of the Shannad and one third of the members of the Dáil. When the President receives the petition, he must consult with the Council of State. If the President agrees that the proposal is of such national importance, he will refuse to sign the bill until a referendum has been held. The referendum must be held within 18 months of the President's decision not to sign the bill. So the point that I'm making here is, if the government do not call a constitutional referendum, if we can introduce a lobby campaign that is sufficient to force the majority of the members of the Shannad and one third of the members of the Dáil to agree that the bill is of such national importance that the people of Ireland should decide whether it becomes law, then once this is presented to the president, he must consult with the Council of State and thereafter he may refuse to sign the bill until a referendum has been held. That said, I do actually believe that the government will have to call a referendum by virtue of the precedent set down in Crotty versus Antishuk in 1987, which we are going to look at next. So the question that arises in this regard is, is there a precedent to force a referendum? Crotty versus Antishuk was a landmark 1987 decision of the Irish Supreme Court, which found that Ireland could not ratify the single European Act, the SEA, unless the constitution was first changed to permit its ratification, thereby necessitating a referendum. So it's important that you understand the background to this case to understand its relevance to the pandemic treaty. The SEA was an international treaty entered into by member states of the European communities, designed to accelerate the development of the European communities, in effect creating two bodies of provisions. One, a series of amendments to the treaties which established the various economic communities. And two, a multilateral treaty to coordinate the foreign policies of the member states. So we'll just look at these two areas briefly. In relation to the first area, a series of amendments to treaties which established the various economic communities. The principal changes made were to enumerate a number of areas of community action on which the treaties have been silent, such as the conferring of a power to establish a court of first instance, which would be attached to the European Court of Justice, and the introduction in certain cases of qualified majority voting in substitution of unanimous voting. And the second area was multilateral treaty to coordinate the foreign policies of the member states. So Title Three of the SEA provides that member states shall endeavour jointly to formulate and implement a European foreign policy. In this regard, member states are to consult on issues of general interest and to take account of the positions of other states in their national measures. The provisions of the SEA, which amended the treaties, were incorporated into Irish law by the European Communities Amendment Act 1986 on Christmas Eve 1986, when President Patrick Hillary signed the European Communities Amendment Act 1986 into law. The provisions of Title III were not incorporated into Irish law, but were approved by the Dáil. However, that same day an injunction was successfully sought from the High Court, preventing the Irish government from ratifying the treaty without first putting the matter to a referendum. In April 1987, in Crotty v. Antishuk, the Supreme Court ruled that, as the single European Act was a significant and decisive step along the path to a single European foreign policy, it could only be ratified by referendum. Since the Supreme Court decision in Crotty v. Antishuk, every European treaty has been put to a referendum in Ireland. The case directly led to the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution and established that significant changes to EU treaties required an amendment to the Constitution before being ratified by Ireland. Consequently, Ireland uniquely in the EU requires a referendum for every new or substantive change to a European Union treaty. The substantive issues in the case revolved around the interpretation of Part 3 of the SEA, which codified cooperation on foreign policy matters between the governments of the then 12 member states of the European Economic Community into an international agreement. The majority of the court ruled that if the state ratified Part 3, it would amount to an unconstitutional delegation of the state's external sovereignty. An important quote from Crotty versus Antishuk 1987 states, 
it appears to me that the essential point of issue is whether the state can, by any act on the part of its various organs of government, enter into binding agreements with other states or groups of states to subordinate or to submit the exercise of the powers bestowed by the Constitution to the advice or interests of other states as distinct from electing from time to time to pursue its own particular policies in union or in concert with other states in their pursuit of their own similar or even identical policies. The state's organs cannot contract to exercise in a particular procedure their policy-making roles or in any way to fetter powers bestowed unfettered by the Constitution. They are the guardians of these powers, not the disposers of them. Given the level of cooperation on foreign policy that is required between state parties under both the pandemic treaty and proposed amendments to the international health regulations, coupled with the intention to significantly extend the power and remit of the WHO to authorise it to make legally binding orders against state parties, I would contend that the circumstances that existed giving rise to the Crotty judgment were less severe in terms of an unauthorised delegation of authority than exist right now. In light of this, I believe that in May 2024, the Irish government will agree, in principle, to be bound by the pandemic treaty and amendments to the international health regulations. However, I also believe that thereafter they will put this matter to a referendum to the people. Therefore, I would recommend the following courses of action. 1. Start lobbying both your TDs and Senators now to tell them to vote no in May 2024. And 2. And probably more important, start educating family and friends about the dangers that lie ahead should they vote yes once this referendum comes around. So, to recap, there are two separate but interconnected events taking place at the same time. The first event is the drafting and negotiation of the Pandemic Response Treaty, noting that to date there have been two drafts of this treaty published. The first was on the 1st of February 2023 and the second was on the 30th of October 2023. The second event is the negotiation of amendments to the International Health Regulations 2005. With respect to the health regulations, a body called the Review Committee was established to collate amendments proposed by state parties noting that state parties have proposed more than 300 amendments to the regulations as part of this process to date. The Review Committee has published one report on the 6th of February 2023, which includes both their commentary on the proposed amendments and also a record of all proposed amendments made. Now, in earlier sections of this video, we reviewed in detail both the 30th of October draft pandemic treaty and the 6th of February Review Committee report on the proposed amendments to the health regulations, and I would strongly urge you to watch the video in full. It's also important to note that the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body and the Review Committee have and continue to work together to ensure harmony between the final versions of the pandemic treaty and amendments to the health regulations, such that there is considerable overlap and repetition between the two documents, meaning that if the vote on the pandemic treaty were to pass, but the vote on the amendments to the health regulations were to fail, or vice versa, the outcome would still be detrimental in terms of a loss of individual freedom, political accountability and state sovereignty. For this reason, I would implore you to focus your attention on ensuring that both of these events fail as opposed to focusing your attention on just one of these events. Also, it should be noted that the INB and the Review Committee meet in both public sessions, the agendas, working documents and reports from which are publicly available. However, they also meet in private sessions, noting that the general public are not entitled to view the records of these meetings. Given the very serious consequences that are likely to flow from yes votes to either the pandemic treaty or proposed amendments to the health regulations, it seems astonishing that any meetings would be held in secret session. The only logical conclusion being that there are matters being discussed that neither the INB nor the Review Committee want the general public to be aware of. 
In terms of deadlines, it is intended that countries will vote on both the passage of the pandemic treaty and proposed amendments to the health regulations at the next World Health Assembly meeting in May 2024. So there is less than five months until these critical votes take place. If you want an in-depth understanding of why yes votes on either the pandemic treaty or proposed amendments to the international health regulations would lead to a loss of individual freedom, political accountability and state sovereignty, I really recommend that you watch the video in full as this recap section only lends to the following summarised version. There are currently 195 recognised independent sovereign states in the world. 193 of these states are members of the United Nations, while the remaining two states are referred to as non-member observer states. The World Health Organization, the WHO, can be referred to as the Department of Health of the United Nations, given that the UN itself states that the WHO is the directing and coordinating authority on international health within the United Nations system. The World Health Assembly, or the WHA, is the decision-making body of the WHO and it is at the next WHA meeting that these critical votes on the pandemic treaty and proposed amendments to the health regulations will take place. Now, given that the vast majority of recognised sovereign states are members of the United Nations WHO, WHA, it is reasonable to conclude that authority for global public health but not just public health, is going to be centralised in one governing body, namely the World Health Organisation, if either the pandemic treaty or proposed amendments to the international health regulations are passed. In relation to my earlier comment regarding a yes vote leading to a loss of individual freedom, political accountability and state sovereignty, I say this given that both the pandemic treaty and proposed amendments to the health regulations seek to extend significantly the remit and authority of the WHO to authorise it to make legally binding orders, which the WHO refer to as recommendations. However, these recommendations would be legally binding outside of areas that the average person would regard as encompassing only public health. To understand fully what I mean, I would direct you to the following. One, the definition section of the pandemic treaty where the term One Health Approach is defined. The pandemic treaty, if passed, seeks to implement a One Health Approach at national, regional and international level, which, as the term suggests, is not limited to human health, but also includes animal health, both domestic and wild, plant health, the wider ecosystem, and also water, energy, air, food, climate change and sustainable development. It is also critically important to note that, according to Article 2.2 of the Pandemic Treaty, this One Health approach would apply at all times and not just when a pandemic was declared. The second area that I would direct you to is Article 2, Scope and Purpose of the Proposed Amendments to the International Health Regulations, which, if passed, seeks to amend the scope of the regulations which are currently restricted to public health only to include all risks with a potential to impact on public health. And as stated earlier, given the level of coordination between the INB and the Review Committee, it is fair to conclude that the Review Committee intends all risks with a potential to impact on public health to include all of those areas identified under a One Health approach under the pandemic treaty. So in essence, if either the pandemic treaty or proposed amendments to the international health regulations are passed, independent sovereign countries like Ireland will have relinquished their electorally mandated authority to a singular governing body, the WHO, to implement legally binding orders both during and outside of pandemics at national, regional and international level over public health, animal health, plant health, the wider ecosystem, water, energy, air, food, climate change, sustainable development and over any other area that has a potential to impact on public health. Now, I believe that this delegation of authority, at least in an Irish context, will be found to be unconstitutional unless a referendum is put to the people 
given the 1987 Supreme Court judgment in Crotty versus Ompishuk, the details of which can be found at section 8 of the full video. That said, and regardless of whether a court finds that a referendum must be held or not, there can be little denying that the WHO is seeking to significantly expand its power such that it would have the legal authority to encroach on every possible aspect of your life, such as how many vaccines and boosters you must take to participate in society, whether you are allowed to eat meat or not, the mode of transport you can use and how far you can travel, whether you are allowed to use oil, turf or coal to keep warm during the winter, what source of energy you can use, how many cows you can keep on your land or whether you can own animals at all. All of these decisions and many, many more will be centralised in the WHO and this will absolutely remove any meaningful notion of what it means to be free. As regards political accountability, given that the WHO are not elected by the people, they are not accountable to the people. And like we have heard our own politicians utter countless time with regards to immigration, we have international obligations. The very same excuse will be used to free politicians from any responsibility as regards decisions made by the WHO if the proposed amendments to the international health regulations or the pandemic treaty are passed. And this will be regardless of how those decisions impact on the people of any particular country. And if the people of any particular country can no longer make their own laws, they can no longer be called sovereign. So for the sake of your freedom and the freedom of generations to come, for the sake of maintaining political accountability in this country and others, and in memory of those who died to secure the sovereignty of this nation, tell the politicians and the WHO that the people of Ireland vote no. Thanks for listening.